and the heart of the Kurdish community in northern Iraq. James, some of the latest just coming in this day today as I come to you June 18th. They've attacked Iraq's largest oil refinery, which, again, should cause question of who these attacks really benefit. But let's break it down with an article posted to Global Research that notes the U.S. was trained, or rather, the U.S. trained ISIS, I should say, at a secret Jordan base. Members of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or ISIS, were trained in 2012 by U.S. instructors working at a secret base in Jordan, according to informed Jordanian officials. The officials said dozens of ISIS members were trained at the time as part of covert aid to the insurgents targeting the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The officials said the training was not meant to be used for any future campaign in Iraq, but the Jordanian officials also said ISIS members who received U.S. training to fight in Syria were first vetted for any links to extremist groups like Iraq. James, please help us break down this latest round of seemingly never-ending, decades-long war of aggression. Well, that's exactly what this is about. It's about constant destabilization. And what I mean by this is the real mission accomplished is that this was the long-term plan of, of course, the PNAC crew, and even going back well before them, going back to the Oded Yunom plan, um, Israel has had Iraq in its crosshairs for a very long time, wanting to break it up, wanting to uh, to break up all of the different uh, parts of the region into four warring factions. And as we see the possibility of Iraq being split uh, in an official sense now between Kurds, Shiite, Shiite and uh, Sunnis, I think we are seeing the the beginnings of the possibility of that. So um, some huge shifts that are taking place on the geopolitical table right now. Um, I'm I'm glad you pointed out that U.S. trained ISIS at uh, Jordan base. I think that's a very important story. And that goes back to a story that Boiling Frogs Post uh, broke back in November, December of 2011. And I actually did an interview at that time with uh, with an insider whistleblower who was talking about U.S. training at uh, the, that Jordan Jordan military base. We got a lot of flack for that at the time. Oh, you're just making this up. Why do? Why should we trust you? Um, it was confirmed uh, a, a year later in the alt media, uh, two years later in the MSM, even the Guardian and papers like that uh, were talking about it. And now it comes out, oh yeah, they were training ISIS as well. So a uh, very important little thread of that story right there. And of course, it's being th- framed in a lot of the, uh, the media that's reporting on it as blowback. Oh, it's blowback. No, it's not blowback. It's the US training these terrorists to be terrorists. That's exactly what the U.S. is doing. That's what they've done for a very long time. Let's not sugarcoat it or uh, put a candy uh, floss over it. Um, now, what I what I think is really happening here, and in addition to the breakup of Iraq, we're seeing some huge swings on the geopolitical table and potentially ones with very large ramifications, including the fact that the U.S. and Iran are collaborating um, at, the, at the table right now because both of them do not want do not want uh, ISIS to to reach Baghdad or to to overthrow um, the Iraqi government altogether. Obviously, the Shiites in in Iran have a a vested interest in making sure that the Wahhabi Sunni terrorists don't overrun the country. And uh, the U.S., at least nominally, has to be on their side in all of this. Although Iran should be very careful about this, because if they don't understand that the U.S. is funding the the Sunni terrorists as well, then they're just a bunch of dum-dums. Um, but now we also have Saudi Arabia, of course, which is quite explicitly helping to, uh, to fund and train uh, ISIS and uh, our Wahhabists themselves. They obviously are tacitly and in some respects openly supporting uh, ISIS and thus are against the official U.S. policy. Yet another wedge between the U.S. and Saudis which as Saudi begins to uh, to develop its uh, relations with uh, with China I mean this is becoming a very important shift that's going on right now and some people are talking about this as the end of the petrodollar I don't know if it's the end but it might be the beginning of the beginning of the end and uh, that's going to be a very long process in fact the US and Saudis just signed another 60 billion dollar arms contract their lar- largest ever so I'm not sure that wedge is going to be driven home quite yet but it is forming and that's extremely significant so a lot is on the table right now and of course, this also brings in the possibility that we will see that Syrian intervention after all, because, hey, ISIS was operating from there as well. So you, you gotta, if you're going to send in troops anywhere, you might as well send them to Syria as well. So a lot is happening right now. We're going to have to keep our eyes on this story and, uh, and follow the developments, because I think this is going to turn on a dime. James, we will include links to that Boiling Frogs Post piece, as well as 
things to help flesh out, as you just did, the, the geopolitical scene. And unfortunately, that's not going to be the last time in this episode that we talk about the terror creation complex. However, let's move to our second story this week with another major piece of news that we gave reference to on previous episode of New World Next Week but didn't get into. James, now there's the perfect way to get into the Bo Bergdahl propaganda story because wouldn't you know it, some of the same characters we've been following who help curate and and code the culture and what the official stories are supposed to be, this comes from Variety. Bo Bergdahl movie project in the works from Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bowl. Zero Dark Thirty director Catherine Bigelow and writer-producer Mark Ball are planning a movie based on recently released U.S. Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. The project would be produced through Mark Ball's recently launched Page One production company. Separately, Fox Searchlight has acquired the movie rights to America's Last Prisoner of War, written by the late Michael Hastings, whose story was published in 2012 by Rolling Stone magazine while Bergdahl was still a prisoner of the Taliban. Bo Bergdahl spent, this is the uh, official story as we know it, Bo Bergdahl spent five years as a prisoner of war of the Taliban until his release on May 31st in a controversial exchange for five Taliban prisoners at the U.S. military facility in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The 28-year-old returned on June 13th, again Friday the 13th, to an army medical facility in San Antonio. The Obama administration did not inform Congress of the release, despite the requirement of a 30-day notice of any transfers from Guantanamo. The administration has asserted that it ignored the requirement in the belief that Oswald, I mean, Bergdahl's health was deteriorating. U.S. Special Operations Forces recovered Bergdahl at a helicopter pickup point in eastern Afghanistan. The Army has launched an investigation led by Major General Kenneth Dahl, into Bergdahl's 2009 disappearance and capture in Afghanistan. James, we've covered Catherine Bigelow, Mark Bull, and their pretty much exactly illegal amount of access to critical documents when it concerns the official end of the character known as Osama bin Laden, which gets turned into an Academy Award-nominated film that Michelle Obama doesn't give the Oscar to that. She ends up giving it to a different CIA production. But again, it it, it goes on, coming soon to a theater near you, James. That's exactly right. Well, as much as I detest Bill Maher and his politics and everything he stands for, perhaps we can borrow his New Rules segment to create a new rule of our own. New Rule, if Zero Dark Thirty and its producers or directors or anyone uh, associated with that film is involved with another film um, about a historical subject or an ongoing political subject, chances are it's a psyop and we should treat it as such. So uh, Zero Dark Snow Job is going to be uh, the the veneration of that that CIA uh, NSA insider um, that snow job that's that's taking place, and now we have uh, the Bo Bergdahl snow job, which is just a psyop of a different sort. And uh, that's the way I place this Bergdahl story. Um, this is complete psyop to keep people in the in the war on terror narrative and to keep thinking about that. And I think it's feeding into something very very worrying that I'm seeing developing, which is this new meme of the new 9/11. Uh, we've had Lindsey Graham and others coming out saying they're absolutely certain we're going to be struck. It's another 9-11. Uh, CBS News has headlines up like, will ISIS plan a 9-11 style terror plot against the U.S.? They're definitely trying to ramp up the uh, the terror, the phony war on terror uh, narrative again. Again, can you believe it? Um, and so, uh, because I, I think because their, uh, their, their plot in, in Eastern Europe with Ukraine didn't quite work as planned, so they're kind of dropping that narrative now and going back to their old standard. And I think that this Bo Bergdahl movie, movie and all of that just feeds into that, oh, they've released five terrorist masterminds. I wonder if they'll be involved in the next plot. And then we can all blame it on Obama and go back to some Republican government or something of that sort. Um, a very, very worrying development. So we have to, to be out in front of this one and uh, calling it for the BS that it is. This all really plays into, James, here in the States, what, what you just referred to, that the, the phony political assignments. And this gets built up even more as, as we have this recent Benghazi arrest. And these, James, these are the sorts of things. So whether it's Benghazi or whether it's Bo Bergdahl, this is the real big kind of Fox News rabble rabble talk radio that that's getting the, the phony conversation going. I'm glad you reminded me of the, the fears of are they planning a new 9-11 
I'll include a link to my own snarky tweet that said, you know, is ISIS planning new 9-11 attacks? I don't know. Let's ask at CIA, who just officially joined Twitter in this past week, James. As we make a technology note, we will shift to our third and final segment this week on episode 197 of New World Next Week. As hockey fans in Los Angeles down a drone in a Stanley Cup frenzy. Several videos, James, posted online showing what has been described as hockey fans destroying a Los Angeles Police Department drone outside the Staples Center Friday the 13th night after the L.A. Kings won the NHL Stanley Cup. Riot police were called in to break up what the L.A. Times described as a melee outside the arena where the Kings' victory over the New York Rangers. In one of the clips posted, a drone can be seen hovering over the crowd of hockey fans before it's knocked out of the sky by people throwing shoes and clothing, chanting then, we got the drone, we got the drone. But with no official response, James, no one can really confirm whether the drone in the video actually belonged to the LAPD. But Seattle Police Department did recently give the LAPD drones, however, the types that were given, a Dragonfire X6, which is what Seattle gave LAPD, does not look like what is in this video. So one of the updates from this story, James, and I grabbed this text from Business Insider, a lot of folks suggest that it's called the DJI Phantom Series. And what is that? That's a consumer drone. James, it looks like essentially a consumer drone was flying over just a regular old event that had lots of people around, and the crowd, for whatever reason, turned its rage upon it. Did they think it really was an LAPD drone that they wanted to take down? Or is this some kind of, you know, blow, you know, against the New World Order? I think aside, James, from my own constantly running kind of sidebar comments about the jockocracy only being able to get it up and get excited about sports ball events, I think this is a fascinating story. So is this what is we're going to see more of this in the future? James, is this going to be, you know, as the compact cities happen and they start to roll out the scoops or they start to roll out the drones, are people going to constantly attack them, thereby making them? Well, I guess we'll have to arm them now. That's a very serious question and a very good question. But first, let me just say as a good red-blooded Canadian boy that, of course, it was the hockey fans in the States who took it down. <clears throat> go, go Kings. Um, a- anyway, yes, this is, I mean, such an important story for what it portends and what we can imagine, what we can extrapolate from this. Because, of course, this is just some harmless little whatever commercial drone or, or whatever it was and they got taken down. Not a big deal in the scheme of things, but you really can imagine this extending out. And exactly as you say, I mean, if uh, if people are peacefully taking down a, a drone that's just hovering over them today, well, what's going to happen when the police start arming them? And, oh, well, we need to, we need crowd control drones and all of this. I mean, it is truly nightmare stuff. And I, I don't know about anyone else in the crowd, but I have shivers down my spine when I really think about that developing into the type of nightmare scenario that it can. And we've seen this, of course, with the Hollywood predictive programming through much of our lives. Um, for, for those of us of, of a certain age, we've probably seen this many, many times enacted on the silver screen. So the uh, it, it's probably not hard to imagine this happening. And that's probably part of the point of that programming that we've been instilled with. So Yes, this is, um, I, I, it, it is a good thing that people are reacting that way to the drones, but I see the way, the way this is going, and I think we need a more fundamental struggle against what's happening, because otherwise we are doomed to fall into a cycle that does not end in a happy way as the drones become more and more, and more complex, more and more uh, versatile, more and more able to, to, uh, to win over the, to, to beat the crowds, and, uh, and I don't want to see that reality come to pass, and I'm sure no one else does either. And it's a question of how we can overcome that programming and find a different way out of this nightmare. James, a couple of other related drone notes. Uh, Crash in Vancouver, B.C. A commercial drone crashed in downtown B.C. during the filming of a commercial, which has now actually launched a new review of how they're being used in industry. It's worth noting the number of drone permits issued in British Columbia annually went from six in 2007 to 178 last year. The other note, James, if you can uh, handle the amount of catchy uh, catch, you know, phrases and, ner- and terms in here, Twitter takes selfies to the next level with drones. 
Twitter kicked off the Cannes Lions International Advertising Festival in southern France last Sunday by using drones to take Vine videos above the heads of Twitter employees and various attendees. The videos are actually kind of stunning looking, and they're being shared on a new Twitter account called at Droney. Having said that, James, a lot of folks submit great story ideas to us on Twitter using hashtag New World next week. This week is is no exception. A lot of our, our best folks submitting stories like at Brock West and Daz 